Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, take your seats. We are getting ready to uh, start the last uh, session of uh, our stakeholder day. So welcome back from the lunch break. Also welcome back uh, those of you who follow online. I, don't, I think it was not mentioned yet, but we have uh, roughly 250 people in the room and another 500 following online. So good, good interest uh, to our discussions. Uh, my name is Jukka Malm. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of, of ECA. Uh, and I will be chairing this uh, panel discussion. Will be a, this will be a discussion without slide presentation. So please uh, uh, follow and also contribute uh, later on. Um, we uh, start actually uh, again, like previously, with a slider question, uh, which you can see in the, uh, through the link. So while listening and contributing to the discussion also, please respond to that uh, question, so we can then at the end see uh, what you think about the question as to what you see as the uh, next priority in managing chemicals. And indeed, uh, this session is uh, not so much about uh, what is facing us today and in the next three months, but looking a bit beyond uh, and then linking that uh, to what are we doing here today and actually linking it back to what Björn Hansen was saying in the morning about taking a couple of steps, steps back from the everyday urgencies and, and think a little, why are we doing this, why are we collecting all the data, what it is for, how can we actually make the maximum benefit of it. And this uh, discussion is uh, structured uh, around three main themes. So we start with the more immediate action, what is the direct impact of the completion of the uh, third registration deadline, uh, what are the direct implications for authorities uh, and, and industry. Then uh, we uh, dwell a bit more in the uh, generation of data, the quality of data, and uh, also the downstream, downstream user communication issues and how to make the best uh, out of the data. And then finally, we uh, use um, the last bit of our time to discuss a bit the future. So what do we see uh, coming then uh, in the next years, uh, after now, after 10 years of REITs, what will we see coming uh, during the next 10 years. And with that, uh, perhaps we first introduce our panel members, uh, starting with uh, Marcella. And Marcella Cosgrave comes from uh, Ireland, uh, from the Health and Safety Authority, where she is a senior policy inspector responsible for the uh, stakeholder communication for CLP and REITs. Uh, also, Marcella has been a long-standing member in our member state committee, and is also a manager of the Irish uh, Chemical Help Desk. And I think you also were involved in the uh, forum work at, at some point some in time. Point, yeah. <laughs> so uh, with this introduction, perhaps you can also explain briefly what is your main interest and, and aspect of, of, of interest and perhaps concerns in relation to the upcoming deadline and the follow-up okay. work. Okay. Thank you, Yuka, uh, and thank you to, to ECHO colleagues for the invitation both to be here today and to sit in this panel is certainly a, a, a nice opportunity. Um, I suppose from, from my own point of view and from us as an organisation, our main interest in the REACH 218 deadline is um, as the competent authority and the enforcement authority for, for REACH in Ireland. And as, as Yuka said, I manage our, our chemicals help desk and our REACH help desk back home. And from that point of view, we have a huge interest in the deadline, really from trying to ensure that all of the Irish companies are aware of the deadline if they have registration obligations, and that in particular then they know how to fulfil those regis registration obligations, that they will do so on time, that they're aware of all of the information and the supports that are available to them. So from the help desk side, we're extremely busy um, at this stage with, with registration queries, and um, certainly we would see that continuing um, up to the deadline. It's very much a priority for us back home 
our awareness raising, we are in constant communication with the Irish companies that we know who have pre-registered just to make sure that they are, are on schedule. So that's our, our key focus for the next few months. Okay, thank you, Marcella. Then Crystal, I think well known, uh, and Crystal is our director of registration, sometimes called the queen of registration as well, <laughs> and responsible for many very important things uh, under REITs. So Crystal, very briefly, what is your main aspect, uh, or main, what bothers you most uh, today in terms of the registration? <laughs> well, I guess on what I am focusing right <laughs> yeah. now, so I think you heard it from this morning. Maybe I can give you another insight that you are not fully aware of, is that for managing this registration deadline, as Mercedes was saying this morning, it's the biggest for us, and we had to recruit up to 110 persons to help us in managing the deadline. So you can imagine for an organization of 600 recruiting 100 additional persons, train them uh, and have the infrastructure for them. So it's not only in registration, but it's all the services in ECA, the help desk, of course, but also the, the, the person, uh, the IT support uh, uh, and, and providing the service, uh, um, the HR recruiting uh, and doing the contracts and, and everything. So it's an enormous, and maybe you don't see that because you see always the same people in the room, uh, mostly myself, but Mercedes, uh, Cyril replying on all kinds of uh, legal questions. And, but basically it's uh, quite hectic in ECA. Um, and why are we doing that? It's because we, we care very much about this registration and process. We really believe it's a pillar of rich registration. As we always say, it's the first level of risk management. Once the registration is okay, you've done already a good job in managing your risk uh, and uh, your substances. So for us, it's very keen and we focus very much on SMEs because we really want to make sure that SMEs can register, all those who want to register can register, and, and that's really our focus. And you were asking what is our interest post-registration. What Personally, I'm very interested at what the data that we have collected will be used for uh, interesting purposes. So maybe, maybe we will come back to that later. Indeed, thank you very much, Crystal. Uh, the next panelist is Erwin, Erwin Anis, uh, also a well-known character from uh, CEFIC. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> director of REITs and Chemicals Policy, and also following many meetings, not only uh, Caracal meetings in Brussels, but also many, many meetings in ECA, so a uh, frequent uh, visitor uh, very much in ECA. So uh, what's your aspect uh, to this discussion? Thank you, Yuka. It's a pleasure to be here. I think, uh, well, I'm not thinking, I'm sure that I didn't miss any stakeholder day mm -hmm. since uh, the very beginning. I've seen a major evolution. I think if I look back and I see the stress situations that we got in 2008 with the pre-registrations, also 2010 with the registration deadline, and then getting a little bit more comfortable in 2013, 2018, it shows at least that um, there is confidence in the IT tools. Uh, Companies are confident that it works. They are confident that they can take the telephone, write an email and getting answers if they have concrete questions on their dossiers, on the difficulties that they are confronted with. So we have seen an evolution. For my companies in question, 2018 will be as hectic and as difficult as 2010 and 2013. That's very sure and I'm, how should I say, it's quite simple if you see that this big German company who got the highest number of registrations in 2010 is also the one that got the highest number in 2013 and will have the highest number in 2018, meaning the REACH registration deadline 2018 is not only for small and medium-sized enterprises. All companies are clearly involved in these activities and try to do their best to deliver in time. What I have seen personally is that there is clearly a shift in the things that I'm doing, that I'm interested in, where 2008-2010 was 100% focused on the registration deadline. 
for 2018, I can only say that, for instance, a publication on chemicals, waste and products, plastic strategy, the REACH review, fitness check, chemicals legislation, except REACH, are probably even more important because there we are looking at the future of not only chemical industry, but industry as a total. If we think also about a concept as circular economy, and these are the themes that we really have to look at in depth. Certainly, and that's also something that we will be looking at in our third theme uh, in, in very soon. Uh, then next one is again from ECA, Lena Ylämononen, Director of Evaluation, uh, my colleague from I think 25 years already, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, responsible indeed for uh, dossier and substance evaluation activities in ECA. And previously you worked at uh, DG Environment in the Commission with biocides, for example. So what's your main uh, interest uh, in the topic of today? Thanks, Jukka. Indeed, also I have been in all the stakeholder days, I believe, so it's really exciting, I think. Personally, I feel thrilled how the last phase in registration deadline goes. And of course, for my own uh, part of the ECA work, uh, evaluation E follows R, uh, re uh, registration, so, so really the work that is coming through the registration will end up in form of or the other, uh, potentially on, on my colleague's desk. So it's really exciting to see how many testing proposals we will receive, uh, what does it mean for our, our other work on, on uh, taking compliance of the dossiers, but also cannot resist mentioning also that um, re really this last registration deadline is a, is a joint corporate uh, priority for ECA, so also my directorate uh, staff is prepared to help, if need be, to sort out the, the final deadline push. Thanks. And that goes across all the directorates in ECA, so it's, a, it's really a joint objective for us this year. Uh, next one in our panel is Mr. Thomas Holtmann from uh, Federation of German Industries, uh, and he is the Managing Director of Environment, Technology and Sustainability there, and also has been previously the Group Director in the French-German Institute for Environmental Research. So Thomas, uh, what's your main aspect or an interest into the topic? Thank you. Our main issue is uh, safeguarding the supply chains so that we don't lose substances which are urgently needed for mixtures or for articles uh, to be produced uh, uh, with the help of these substances. And uh, just now we get messages with increasing concern, for instance, from the textile industry. They are very much afraid that they will lose uh, very important ingredients so that they might have to stop production. We have no feeling whether this is justified or not, and therefore I have raised also the question with regard to the Brexit uh, this morning. Um, and I was very pleased to hear that no uh, specific indications so far have appeared that uh, UK companies uh, are reg registering less than others. However, uh, whether all SMEs are really um, capable to do this job, we're still not sure. We have mm. no feeling for that. And another interest, of course, is that those SMEs uh, who have to register, that they take the chance to, to keep their market share, that they stay active and that we don't lose them. Okay, thank you. And then uh, finally, we have um, Costanza Robida from the European Consensus Platform for Alternatives, and she is the scientific officer at the Center of Alternatives to Animal Testing at University of Constance in Germany. So, um, Constanza, what's your main interest? Uh? Uh, first of all, if I may, I would like to explain uh, better what ECOPA is. Uh, ECOPA is the European Consensus Platform for Alternatives, uh, so it's not uh, uh, another NGO for animal welfare, but rather it's uh, our primary goal is to uh, promote and foster the dialogue uh, between the different uh, um, stakeholders that are involved in this uh, project, and those are governmental and regulatory authorities, academia, industry, and uh, animal protection and welfare organization. And uh, ECOPA is an umbrella 
uh, the, for platforms established at national level. For example, it is the FinCOPA here in Finland, and uh, as I'm Italian, I belong to IPAM, which is the Italian platform. And uh, we, are, we are convinced that the, the final goal of full replacement of animal use for scientific purpose uh, is gained only through the uh, constructive dialogue uh, between uh, people. And so, uh, REACH, uh, ECA is the ideal environment for that because it joins uh, uh, industry, uh, regulatory, but uh, um, also academia, uh, because uh, uh, new uh, methods that are developed at the university level should be uh, introduced uh, and, uh, and used uh, during the REACH registration process. In this sense, I must uh, thank ECOPA, uh, ECA because uh, it was uh, very much active uh, in this sense, uh, for example, with the uh, document that was issued last year about uh, uh, new approach methodologies. Uh, I also appreciate a lot that it was not used the name alternatives, uh, because it's not alternatives, it's really a new approach methodology. And I, I, and I fully understand that uh, the application is difficult. So uh, this is also our interest, because now, uh, in the future, we will have, and still now, We'll have, uh, we have the database of chemicals that is uh, so rich of data that can really be exploited for further development, use, uh, and so on. Very good, thank you. Thank you all. Um, let's then move to our first theme, which is the impact uh, uh, of the deadline. And actually, I would like to start by linking to the uh, slider questions uh, that were posed in the previous sessions. And one of the top questions was, uh, if I re rephrase it, was that we in companies are so, so busy now with uh, preparing our dossiers for the deadline, so why do you still, in ECA, uh, keep on doing substance evaluation and perhaps other processes? Why don't you take a, a, a rest and let us work and let us focus on the deadline and then continue once everything is clear? So perhaps uh, my colleagues from ECA, if you could uh, uh, a bit elaborate on, 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 on this argument. I can start, and then Crystal, maybe especially the, the little campaign <laughs> that you already had in the morning. I mean, could be uh, taken by you. Indeed, I mean, the, we have lots of ongoing activities in evaluation. So we have ongoing compliance checks, testing proposals, um, and also indeed several substance evaluations ongoing in different phases of the of the decision making, for example. And the REACH legal text is pr usually providing quite a clear legal frame when we have to issue what and also what is then the response time for the resistance to comment. So we have not ever planned to stop the machine uh, of, of these actions which are core in, in, in REACH implementation. Um, we understand the difficulty um, of, of resistance now at the same time working with different priorities but uh, I believe that it should be still manageable. Uh, and of course, always, if there's a specific problem in meeting a deadline, for example, set in our legal, uh, legally binding decision five years ago, yes, you can contact ECA and, and explain the circumstances, and then we'll see what we can do, if needed, together with the enforcement authorities. The only thing that I can, comes to my mind, indeed, spontaneously at the moment, what can be done with, uh, with, with little impact on our work, uh, then on the evaluation is the batching, issuing the substance evaluation draft decisions coming from the evaluations done in 2017. This is typically done in, in April, um, and of course that is just in the eve of the, of the registration deadline, and it might affect up to 200 registrants um, issuing the third, uh, starting the 30-day uh, commenting period. So this is something that we are considering at the moment, whether it's uh, unproblematic to actually postpone it uh, after the deadline and then only start the consultation. But we have to verify also with our partners in the, in the uh, member states if this is okay. Mm. Krista, you already uh, touched up on the, the screening. Do you want to add something? Uh? Uh, I think uh, it's what I was explaining this morning, this uh, campaign that we are doing, and you have received letters from me, actually, signed by me, is that uh, while I'm at the same time, I really advise you to focus on your registration, as I was saying this morning. So it might look a bit uh, contradicting, but again, it's an exercise that we do every year. Uh, it's... it's a it's to help you, actually, is to indicate to your, your, your companies that your substance is being looked at by authorities. As I was saying this morning, certain substances will end up on the community 
rolling action plan, the correct list, and therefore they will not be looked in detail by the member states. Uh, it might be in 18, I look at uh, Lena, 18 or 19 even, so there is still time to update. Uh, the main point of this exercise is to signal you that uh, we wouldn't like to uh, pick up the substance for the wrong reason, and the wrong reason is very often the exposure, and therefore it's so important to update your users. Now, if there is a problem or you need to signal something to us uh, because you don't have time to update the dossier, but you want to signal that uh, there is a problem in your dossier, the best thing is indeed to contact us. Either well, I, This morning I said to one of the person asking me the question separately to send me an email, but actually at a discussion with our colleagues in the help desk, no, don't send me an email, maybe send it via the contact uh, form on the ECA help desk, and then we will take care of that and we will take care of the information. So that's my best advice right now. Thank you. Uh, Erwin, how does this uh, seem from the industry and the manufacturing industry point of view, resistance point of view, the, the situation that we basically have to continue with uh, all the processes? Well, I think first of all, all the bigger companies, and I should not limit to CEFIC, but also within Euromito, Konkawe, FECC, are well aware that all activities are taking place simultaneously, are influencing one in other. But I have at least a lot of understanding and a kind of sympathy for the frustration which is living amongst industry. In the sense that I see three different departments within the agency, which have all their own staff, which are addressing their questions. And all these questions are not arriving in three different departments in a company. They arrive in the same department at the desk of the same people, who are indeed working extremely hard, who are confronted with the difficulties and the time it takes to come to agreements in CIEFs to prepare the dossiers, because at least my big companies do not have the 31st of May as deadline in mind. For them, it's very clear that they want to register before the end of March to be sure that within the three weeks they have their registration number and that they can guarantee to the other members of the CIEF that the lead has been sending in the dossier and that hence everything is ready for the other registrants to, to join. And that's where you have this uh, vague of frustration and why is this all coming together. I think, indeed, it should be greatly appreciated if there could be a further reflection in what can be done, indeed, to facilitate um, the registration deadline workload and to diminish as much as possible all the other requests, knowing that, indeed, there are a lot of mechanisms which are extremely difficult to stop and that it's clearly not the kind of a full moratorium of all other activities except reach registration which are asked for. But it's clearly reflect on the additional burden which is unfortunately always falling on the same relatively small group of people within the companies which are going for it. Okay, thank you, Erwin. And others, just let me know if you want to intervene on, on this point. Uh, I, I think the, your, your message is clear, and uh, I think we have to, in ECA, uh, consider this and, and see what flexibility there is, acknowledging that the formal processes are running, they must run, uh, but I, I think the message is clear. Yes, Thomas, please. So I may just to add to that, there is uh, one more dimension of communication since customers and suppliers also communicate with these manufacturers. Do, do you really register? What do you intend to do? When will you be ready? When can you uh, give me guarantee that you will supply me uh, later on or that uh, we can uh, supply you? And uh, this adds to that and is one dimension more of communication. And therefore, mm -hmm. therefore, we should really focus uh, the requests from yep. the agency uh, to those. They have very much on the desk. Yep. 
Okay. If I may add to that, I think this is indeed an important point. Uh, we have to keep the mentality of industry uh, quiet and smooth that there is a belief that we will make the registration deadline in time and that substances will be available. You heard that this morning already in many uh, presentations that there are reflections on going in the director's contact group on how we can help. But there is one aspect that I personally think that we should also reflect on, and that's the absolute amount of figures that you have been seen. We are talking about estimations of 60,000 registrations, 25,000 potential substances. I should like to remind you that this is ultimately based on a research activity that has been initiated in 2003, and where I think everyone has been astonished on how accurate the estimation has been for 2010 and 2013. But that, I think, that was the rather easy part of it. I think we have to accept this kind of uncertainty on these figures. Have their b I'm not sure that all these substances have been on the market. So if we have less substances than we got in mind, I'm absolutely not sure that the supply chain will miss substances. And that's an important thing that, that I think that we have to communicate, that we are not sure that all these substances have been in the supply chain. And in cases that there are indeed problems in dedicated uh, supply chains and dedicated industries, I think there has been a good and decent reflection on how help can be offered uh, without or within the limits which are set by the legislation. Mm. Christella, I guess yeah. you want to react. Yes. Yeah, I want to indeed. Uh, that's something that we are a bit, um, it's a crystal ball for our ECA, this story of uh, number of dossiers. I think for the number of dossiers, we are relatively comfortable with our numbers. As Mercedes was showing this morning, we are ahead of the numbers. Plus, we have done uh, recently in November, December, a short study uh, to reconfirm the numbers, not only based on the 2003 numbers, but based on the information that we are in our database. So now for the number of substances, indeed, it's the number of substances, the 25,000 comes from 2001 or 2003. And then where we have more uncertainty, as you're right, Erwin. But on the other side, what we know for years, the companies have rationalized their portfolio. And that we all know. I mean, the substance it, uh, registration has been an occasion uh, for rationalizing. We heard it from the retailer presentation this morning, where you can substitute by uh, other formulation or whatever. So I am a bit like Erwin. I'm not convinced at all that there are actually 25,000 substances in the range of one, on one to 100 tonnes on the European market right now. But from ECA point of view, we don't know. We, we are hearing rumours or people saying substances may disappear from the supply chain. But uh, until we have uh, really companies coming to us saying we are very worried for this type of substances or for this substance, we cannot do anything. And, uh, and so far, nobody came to us saying, I'm going to miss that substance. It never happened so far. And for us, we are really here to help, see what we could do, uh, provide advice. But so long you don't come with real case, it's very difficult to do. Perhaps then the message here is that, uh, like with some other of our, let's say, uh, targets or assumptions in our work program, people easily mix up mm -hmm. what is a target and what is a workload assumption. And the 60,000 dossiers or 30,000 substances is more a, a, an assessment or estimation mm -hmm. as to what uh, might be coming. It's not a target and it's, it's not an issue if we are not meeting that figure. Exactly. But it's exactly. more perhaps spreading this message around now mm -hmm. by all of us that uh, don't be panicking because of the numbers, just panic if at all, if actually you are missing your substance then at the end of the day. And then even for that, we have solutions and mechanisms in place to deal with that. Yeah. Very good. Um, another issue um, that people may have in their mind is then, uh, okay, the deadline is over, 
when can we expect that the enforcement authorities become active on the, on the registration? I think previously there has been two, under our enforcement forum, there have been two harmonized projects related to registration. The first was, I think, on the pre-registration even very early on, and on the other one after the 13th deadline. So, um, Marcella, from us, you are the one who is perhaps closest to, to enforcement. So, what is your expectation? What could come and when in terms of the enforcement after the deadline? Okay, thank you. You can, I suppose, yeah, as the one enforcement authority sitting up here, I can certainly make some comments on enforcement. We've been doing REACH enforcement since REACH entered into force. Um, and we certainly do registration inspections. Um, any companies that we visit, we would you know, do a registration inspection. And we have each year for the last, I think, three years now at this point, been doing registration audits where we would pick a number of, of a relatively small number of, of Irish companies that we know have registered and go in and do an audit there. That will continue with or without the deadline. Um, we haven't, um, from a national priority point of view, we haven't yet discussed how much we will up that as such after the deadline. But um, following the deadline, the main focus will be the no data, and no market um, rule of, of reach. And we will see that continuing. Um, I think Christelle mentioned this morning of the, the next, or one of the next REF projects that we would expect in, in 219. And we will certainly um, participate in that as, as a member state. We're already beginning to have a think about what we would do and how much resources we would put into that. I can't say a huge amount about the focus of it yet because my understanding is it hasn't as yet been discussed within the, the forum working group. But one of my understandings is that a lot of it will um, focus on intermediate registrations. And this is something that was on our radar even before this REF project came to mind. We have quite a few intermediate registrations in Ireland, being a, a pharmachem country, I suppose, in, in particular. And it is something that we intend to focus. And just, I suppose, from industry's point of view, these kind of inspections and audits are always pre-announced. We don't just turn up at somebody's door. So from industry's point of view, um, they would certainly have a lot of time to prepare. We would tell them in advance almost what we would expect. We would absolutely encourage them to have all of their paperwork um, in place to be able to prove to the inspectors in particular that they are meeting their requirements and in particular also that there is um, their personnel, technical personnel on site for the day or two that we're there that they can answer the questions. Intermediate registrations, of course, I don't need to indicate that they would absolutely have to be able to demonstrate the strictly controlled conditions. That's one aspect that we will certainly be focusing on and that the necessary proof is there from their downstream users, for example, that they are also working under the strictly controlled conditions. And I have to say that that is something that is also new to our inspectors from a technical point of view. Um, and we do have the guidance in place. Um, and that's something that, from our point as an NEA, that we will have to, to also come to terms with. Just a little note on customs, because my understanding is as well that um, this is something that may be an aspect of, the, of that project. And again, we have to think this through. We have worked a little bit with customs in the past. And what we have done with our customs colleagues is to ask them, for example, for a list of companies that have imported certain chemicals or groups of chemicals into Ireland from outside the EU. And this is a good way for us to get a list of companies that may be EU importers. And we can compare them then with our list of Irish um, registrants and pre-registrants. Because we find that um, we are, as a small country maybe, we're time and time again going back to the same companies from a registration point of view. That's something, as an organisation, we are not keen to do. We're almost punishing the compliant, you know, those companies who have registered. So we're always keen to find companies who, who may not have, have registered, and they're not the easiest to find. But it will be enforcement as, as usual. Um, we may increase it after 218, but we are already, already doing it and issuing um, enforcement advice and enforcement notices and giving companies a certain amount of time to register or to maybe increase the registration. We find some companies have registered, for example, in a low tonnage 
banned and they're actually importing a lot more than, than their tonnage. So that's something that we would straight away go into. So, yeah. okay. It's good that you mentioned also the, the cooperation with the customs authorities because I understand that one of the experiences in the early uh, REF process, the harmonized process, was actually uh, relatively high non-compliance with the um, only representatives. So I, I would assume that this is perhaps also a point of interest then in the, in the follow-up enforcement project. It's yeah. certainly a point of interest for yeah. us. We have a, a number of ORs um, yeah. in, in Ireland, so that's an element of the project yeah. that we will certainly be coming yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. Lena? I just wanted to take the opportunity to emphasize how awfully important it is that there is indeed national enforcement yeah. working. The credible, credible implementation is really dependent on the, on the enforcement and that can only be done by the national authorities. And I think REITS is a, is a great system also in terms that it has set up this forum for the, for the coordination, harmonization of enforcement. So all t currently 28 member states should be uh, aligning and, and setting the priorities. Yet, of course, it's a different thing how they, what resources and capacities they have uh, to do the, uh, the inspections. But for example, for ECA to indeed um, to have a, have a com comfort that there is somebody who could check in real life um, whether the facts that have been um, or, or issues that have been put on paper are also uh, really, I mean, re uh, reflecting the truth on, on site is really important also for the mm -hmm. motivation of our work, which is based very much on the, not even any pa more papers, but on, on the bits and, and bytes. Mm. Edward. Well, at SEFIC, we have been finding uh, enforcement uh, from the very beginning extremely important. Also looking at uh, the legislations that we got already in place and where you see if it's not enforced, it will never work. Uh, I think that we have been and are probably still the only industry association in Europe and maybe in the world who has a dedicated working group looking at enforcement. And I should like to thank my colleague from the Belgian Federation who has been doing a marvelous work uh, that we have been fine-tuned with CEFIC in coming up with recommendations article per article in the REACH legislation on which documents you need to present when there is an enforcement activity, what you can try to delegate and see who is responsible for what. So enforcement has been extremely important uh, for us. It's creating and guaranteeing the level playing field. And I must say that um, I uh, feel very much supported by my new director general, Marco Mensing, who said in February last year in Rio de Janeiro, in a preparation for a SICAM meeting, and who mentioned, repeated before the Chinese authorities in September, last year, how important we find enforcement. And if we are talking about enforcement, many downstream industries are not understanding why SEFIC is also interested in enforcement on articles. I think we are not willing to deviate uh, the, the scope of inspectors. It's very clear. Uh, inspections have to take place at manufacturing sites, at sites where formulations take place, at European sites where they are making uh, articles. But if we want to protect the entire European manufacturing industry in all kinds of industry, in all kinds of supply chains, then we have to realize that, and you saw what I should call rather dramatic figures, 71% of all registrations done for the 2018 deadline are substances that are not manufactured in Europe. If we are talking about articles, it's even worse. So if we want to give support for whatever European manufacturing industry in Europe, we really have to reflect on how can we improve enforcement activities towards articles that are coming into the European economy, also realizing that within the circular economy, if we want to recycle, we must make sure that it's not containing substances that we don't want and that we hence have or that authorities have the tools to find out those which are not respecting the rules. Again, it's not for diminishing the attention on what we are doing in our facilities, it's just to see how we can maintain jobs for growth in Europe. 
Okay, thank you very much, Erwin. Uh, perhaps uh, Costanza first, yeah. Um, I, I would like to see also um, the control of uh, new animal tests in the enforcement project. I know that uh, something has been uh, introduced to control when uh, uh, tests have been performed uh, without the testing proposal procedure, but I would like to see control also in a uh, uh, minor endpoint like uh, skin and eye irritation, skin sensitization, acute oral toxicity, because for those endpoints uh, there are alternatives available. And uh, in many cases, uh, this is not, uh, uh, is not respected and it's very easy. You just uh, perform the test outside the EU to bypass the EU regulation. But it, it should be clear that uh, we are a European company and we have to respect European regulations. And I hope that this message should be very clear from, uh, from the uh, uh, regulatories uh, in Europe to the companies. Okay. Perhaps, Lena, if you react to that, and then Crystal, and then we move to the yeah. next uh, topic. No, just to confirm that at least from ECA sites, we are indeed I mean, bringing what we find from the dossiers, where we have suspicions that I mean, the, the last resort principle regarding animal testing has not been respected, we inform the national authorities and invite them to consider enforcement action. And this is something that is ongoing and discussion also at the forum level. So, uh, of course, the, the priorities is a, is a different thing, but we are, we are not stopping our activity to bring cases for, for the enforcement. Thank you. Okay. Crystal. Yeah, it was, it's really not important. It's just to comment on what uh, Erwin said about numbers, uh, because you said that 70% of uh, the registration were coming of the substance were manufactured out of Europe. Actually, let's not dramatize so much. <laughs> it's actually 70% of the registration that come out of companies, okay, importers only representative, but a lot of them have some substance already registered, probably by EU manufacturer. So, I mean, yeah. just mm -hmm. a, a detail, right. but just that yep. let's not panic, not everything <laughs> is out of Europe. So. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to come in very briefly, um, yeah. thank you, just on the animal testing and the testing as a last resort. And certainly we have received um, such communications from ECHA on the enforcement and it is certainly a priority for us. Um, but just from our point of view, and I think a lot of enforcement authorities find this, that it's actually a difficult issue to enforce because it's retrospective enforcement. The test is done. There is very little, and we're still looking into this, that as an enforcement authority we can do except to say to the company, we did note that you did this. It's not something that you should have done. It, it, it's a difficult thing. We can't prohibit something you know, it's, it, the test is done and it's a difficult thing for us and we are, we're certainly looking into it, but we have received these, these communications, okay. but it's retrospective. Okay, so. uh, clearly enforcement is raising quite yep. some, some ideas and, and, and contributions, that's very good. I think from my point of view, I think where we can improve is to try to see enforcement even closer as an integrated part of the whole legislation and the machinery. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's still seen as a bit of an isolated area which is not always uh, linked to the other priorities, but what you are making here as, as, as your main points, I think that is very clearly linking it to the main priorities of the objectives for the legislation, of the uh, competitiveness of EU industry and, and all of those points. Um, actually, this first session was only to warm you up. I think you are warm up now and we can go to the content, the real content, which uh, I would like to move to the issue of data. We are. Uh, finalizing the data collection exercise for phasing substances and uh, perhaps uh, linking to the first question, so why are we not stopping or slowing down our processes in ECA? Actually, when we have the data, 1st of June, will that somehow directly impact our operations, either Crystal in your field or, or Lena in your field or in our risk management field? How, how do you see the practical impact of receiving the data or will everything continue as, as, uh, as they are carrying out today? I let you start, but <laughs> I might think. <laughs> I, think uh, I think Crystal and, and her troops have has much more hands-on on the data and manipulating and, and, and screening it, etc. But, but certainly it's, it's indeed a big milestone in the whole REACH implementation. So seeing what is the really now registered, what is the baseline, what is on the market, what is being used, what are the users, is. But of course, all this boils down also to the question how reliable, accurate the data is. And there's a, I, I think we have a, 
some experience that it is not from the previous deadlines, it is not perfect, and hence the, the, my, my directorate's activities, dossier evaluation in particular, but also substance evaluation, will have to, have to act on the, on, the, on the quality of the, and compliance in particular, of course. Um, the substance evaluation, indeed, as well, will potentially have a, have a totally new era now, when, when there is indeed a big number of substances with relatively thin um, basic data set in the in the, base, in the in the data set in the database so basically if we want to really identify substances which are carcinogenic or reproduction toxic or or, or bbt type we basically would need to go and examine uh, them further under the substance evaluation. And of course here the, the cumulative tonnages, the, the use types, exposure, all that should play then a role in setting the priorities. But indeed the priority screening and priority setting is very much done uh, by Crystal, your, your uh, expert, so maybe I, I hand over to you. What does it mean to you? Yeah, so I still don't have a good uh, idea what to reply to this one. So, but basically, there are two aspects. There is the aspect of prioritization, indeed, and you, you summarize very well the situation. Um, we have much less data for these substances, so uh, it's sure that we need now to put a strategy in place to see how we are going to look uh, at this one to ten ton uh, uh, dossier, uh, how we are going to prioritize them based on the information that we have. And there will be a reflection in ECA uh, with uh, the colleagues in evaluation, with the colleagues of risk management, on building a strategy on how we are going to tackle this, this dossier. That, that would say the first thing. Of course, we never look uh, only at the data. And that's what I was saying this morning. We have uh, a lot of information that in our databases. We are screening everything that we can find uh, with the other regulatory authorities, like uh, US, uh, EPA, Canada, where we collaborate a lot, actually, with. And we are also screening all kinds of databases uh, of information uh, on these chemicals. So we are screening all that, but it's, it's sure that for the last tonnage, it means another strategy. Now, from the data perspective, that's a different story, because here now we start to have what we could say the biggest regulatory database in the world, that's for sure. And that now there is a reflection to have that we have started already last year on what are we going to use, do with the data. It's sure that these data, the reach uh, is being considered as a baseline uh, let's say legislation. It's the baseline also for other legislation and for the DOTA legislation the, on the products, on the water framework directive. So we need to make best use of these data. And um, that's the reflection that we are having in ECA. On one side, on the other side, there are a number of things that we would like, and Constanza, you would be happy to hear that, but we have already made a data set available for download with key results of these studies, so that other than ECA can work on this data, uh, can validate QSAR models, can uh, develop other, other methods, and uh, also cross-check alternative methods or new methods against the uh, experimental data that we have. So we would like uh, to have a reflection on how to extend that and how to best make uh, this data available to third parties. But again, it's the beginning of a reflection. The number of hurdles, like uh, the reliability of the data, is one hurdle. I mean, that's why we insist so much on compliance check and, uh, and uh, update of dossier. But there is also other hurdles, like the copyright issues and uh, and that we need to solve together. But there is a beginning of a strategy uh, in ECA to see what we are going to do with all this data. Right, thank you very much, Crystal, for that. Perhaps we come back to the more a bit advanced ideas of using the data at the last part of the discussion. Uh, if you a bit dwell on the, um, on the quality of the data and also the, uh, what also Lena or Crystal you were raising about that for low tonnage dossiers, of course, the, the data package is it's much poorer as compared to, to the high tonnages. So what kind of a challenge is this is facing for us? And um, uh, already, uh, I think, uh, Constanza, you, you were referring to some of our reports and some of our work on the alternatives and new approach methods, which is also one of the streams uh, where we are working to actually see how we can use screen data, not only from our own database, but also from other uh, other uh, data sources. Um, 
in, in relation to that, um, of course, one area that is kind of a bottleneck is then uh, alternatives and, and different type of data for especially predicting the, the long-term effects. And uh, there, perhaps, Costanza, what is your view? Are there any very promising, important initiatives ongoing that actually could help uh, solving this issue, that we could really make a leap towards uh, relying on alternatives, uh, as we today still have to, for the long-term endpoints, rely on mostly on the, on the in vivo testing? Mm. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there is uh, the integrated project, the, the Youth of Risk, uh, which is uh, dedicated uh, to the uh, development of a uh, new system based on uh, human cells uh, to, to study the uh, effect of chemicals on repeated dose exposure. This is uh, one of the missing points of uh, alternative methods. And, uh, and REACH uh, uh, that are very important because uh, they may support uh, for QSR and read across. In this sense, I would also like to ask you whether it is possible to, uh, to see when uh, um, a study uh, has uh, expired. So it has been uh, submitted uh, for 12 years. Uh, because at the moment that's uh, not possible to, to understand. And in that case, it would have been very helpful to, to down, download it uh, directly. Another very interesting possibility would be to uh, have the opportunity to use for free uh, data and read across, uh, for example. This is also very important. And what uh, we are al already doing with the rich data is to evaluate them. So, for example, there is uh, uh, the study to understand whether there is a redundancy of in vivo studies. There are already some uh, available reports that demonstrated in some cases uh, the 90 day oral repeated dose toxicity study uh, adds nothing to the 28. Uh, uh, stud uh, day study, so this is also interesting. And what we are also doing is to analyze uh, when uh, uh, the same uh, um, in vivo study has been repeated on the same chemicals uh, to evaluate uh, the repeatability of uh, the in vivo study and also the reliability, because uh, the cases when uh, there are discardant results are really many. And so we are also trying to uh, um, explain that uh, in vivo is not uh, as reliable as uh, most of the people think they are. Mm. Good. That was a long list of issues, perhaps mm. we cannot discuss <laughs> all of that. Uh, thank you for that. But perhaps to pick uh, one of the points, uh, you were, for example, referring to the, um, the, the Toxirisk yes. uh, project. Um, Lena Witt just recently uh, published a report on the ap regulatory applica applicability of the alternatives, mm. so how promising you see these research projects in terms of the actual regulatory applicability and the time frame in making any new results uh, available and applicable in our regulatory context? I think there are indeed, I mean, important research uh, initiatives ongoing, but I think the fact is that they are not going to produce, let's say, real alternatives for one-to-one -one replacement of in vivo longer-term testing in, in short time frame. Maybe we talk about 10, 20 years. Having said that, it's still important to invest in this research because without that, it won't happen ever. So, in the meanwhile, I think we will rely on the in vivo data uh, and other type of uh, alternative approaches um, like read across and categories, um, weight of evidence using all the available data um, to, to really assess the, the higher tier, especially human health um, uh, impacts. I think regarding indeed the, the data and, and one important thing in the database will be to acknowledge the, the multiple links between the substances and registrants. So our experience so far is that yes, read across and grouping is the most used way to adapt the information requirements. Uh, so it's not in vitro or QSOS, yeah. it's, it's really the read across. Uh, and, and grouping, and this also means that for, for the authorities, we need to really move from, from looking one substance at a time to looking at groups of substances. This is a challenge to member states' authorities uh, when screening candidates for CORAP. It's definitely a challenge for ECA when, when assessing the, the compliance of, of dossiers or even testing proposals. But this is where we where clearly we need to go. And of course, it is also the new scientific area, which is really intriguing. And, and also the in vitro QSR new assessment 
new type of um, data can also serve uh, a purpose in, in, in building more reliable read across and category uh, justifications. So it's not all black and white either. Yeah. Thank you. Crystal. I would like to come back on the um, compliance of the data and the reliability on the data. Because actually, when we were looking on whole assessment, and I, I was not working on that in the commission when, before coming to ECA, but I was following the discussion from my colleagues, and we were always being asked uh, the problem of animal testing. So we had made estimates on uh, what which would cause in that uh, direction. But actually, there had been much less testing uh, propose that was ever anticipated. And if you look at the data sharing costs that we were discussing this morning, um, I mean, it's, it's striking to see that it's more the administrative costs are higher than the data cost. And I can tell you that in the database, uh, we have many more waivers sometimes that experimental data. And we have published um, last year a report where it's very clear. So for us, uh, we were discussing earlier on the 1 to 10 tons, and it's clear that we need to have a strategy for the 1 to 10 tons, but uh, we need certainly before to continue to focus on the uh, substance in high tonnage. And for that, um, I mean, we need to be clear. This morning I was showing this diagram where it was green, low priority, red, high priority, and gray, um, the, we don't know. And actually, I didn't put any numbers on number of substances, but I can, I can be open, actually. And if you look at the number of substances, we are looking at 4,000 substances, roughly, and half of them, roughly, we don't know. So it means that we are not able, based on the data provided in the dossier, to make a judgment whether, yes or not, we need to have a regulatory measure, or when, yes or not, we can say it's low priority. So the, that, that's something that we have to be clear. And uh, in ECA, that, that's why we insist on dossier updates, and that's why also you, you will see compliance check on your dossier for a number of years, because we need to bring this data. After all, it's not, reach is not an administrative exercise, it's to ensure safe use, and we need to be able to reply whether yes or not, in Europe we have achieved safe use, and we need in ECA to be able to give this reply, and for the time being we are not able to give this reply. Mm. So I think it's really the thing that we should put on the table in terms of reliability of data and compliance of data. Yes, because th that indeed is the basis for then any follow-up uh, both in the supply chain and for authorities, any risk management intervention is exactly. based on, on good quality data. Um, and that was already uh, also touched upon in the previous sessions, the, uh, the issues with the updates. And all in all, the issue of the reliability of the data, it's not, nothing new. It was, it's been with us almost 10 years now. Uh, with, I, I haven't seen, of course, there's continuous improvement, but not really a leap towards something else. Mm -hmm. And perhaps two questions there. What, what could you see as... Uh, new ways of uh, improving the data, also from the side of industry, and, and what could be the incentives for industry to actually take more seriously the issue of the updating of the dossiers. As we've been hearing, I, I think, is it six, uh, around two-thirds of the dossier crystal that have never been updated since the first uh, registration, something like that, 60%. We were never updated, and, and it's just impossible to believe that there was no relevant new information available for such a big amount of dossiers. So, uh, perhaps from industry side, what, what, what could you see as uh, real incentives to, to make industry more move on, on this area? Well, I think uh, animal welfare has indeed been one of the driving forces behind industry uh, for not proposing new test proposals. That's very clear. Um, and then you have, of course, the going into the direction of preferentially negative read across rather than positive uh, read across, which is, of course, playing uh, an important role in this debate. I think that, and personally, I'm very much interested in the outcome of some of the ongoing projects uh, within ECHA, seeing the fact that you had that reduced number 
of substances under starting substance evaluation in 2017, which has been resulting in the so-called COLA, collaborative approach, where industry is discussing together with authorities, uh, some um, member states, on the kind of what can we discuss, well, what is the way to go to come to a kind of general approach within a specified group of substances in choosing the tests that have to be done, choosing the substances which you should test and what is the probability that you can then come to a decent uh, read across justification which is acceptable. A second project um, is um, an initiative with CEFIC and Plastics Europe on one hand on um, starting with about 1,500 substances which got in the ECA database somewhere the word additive in plastics or polymers into it to see what are the substances that are used, what are those having the highest uh, potential of exposure to consumers, what do we know about the hazard properties and try to improve the ranking, looking at what kind of plastics uh, they are used in. And I know you have a comparable uh, program running with uh, the metal sector and uh, Euromito. So there I hope that we can see to what extent that we can get an improved collaboration in an earlier phase and where for some of my companies, because I hear different uh, stories about different group of substances that are looked at. Some are talking about, yes, this is collaborative, and some others are talking, this is only collaborative in one direction. So, but if we can find, let's say, the good equilibrium, and if we can learn from this first project, this may be a step forward, because as you have seen and said, we talk about major clusters of group of substances. And that will be the way to, to improve the situation, starting from smaller groups or clusters, and then to see how we can have the learnings out of that to make the ultimate progress in uh, the more complex, more bigger group of uh, substances. Indeed, also. Uh Clustering, uh, grouping, uh, priority setting are sort of common themes where we are working indeed quite much in collaboration with the industry. And it will be interesting to uh, assess later this year the first results of such collaboration because also there has been, it's not a secret, there has been also critical voices about authorities using their resources to kind of a voluntary work instead of using the regulatory measures that are in our hand. But I, I think the question is through which of the tools or combination of tools we get the best result. Yeah. Uh, how do we use our resources in the most effective way and efficient way? I'd, uh, just, um, yeah, I'd like to come in on that to say that we actually were one of the member states who have participated in this collaborative project. I'm not quite sure which side we sit on or <laughs> on your, your report, but certainly from our side it was um, interesting. And um, as a competent authority, we would certainly be in favour of, of grouping as such and, and working in that way for, for lots of reasons. And I think Lena brought it up. It, um, while it can take a lot of work in the first instance, and we certainly saw that both on our side and with our industry colleagues in this project, it will probably save a lot of time and resources in the long run. And I think um, it would certainly be more efficient rather than going substance by substance. We can take groups. Mm. It will have advantages from an animal welfare point of view because we'd like to think we can build on, on read acrosses. So from our side, we certainly see it as the way forward. And interestingly, we are in the middle of manual screening or preparing for manual screening at the moment for upcoming um, evaluations. And there are many groups um, being put together and, and more than we've seen before and member states are, are stepping up to evaluate these groups of substances. So I think when we're looking to the future, certainly from an authority point of view, it's where we see our, our future work. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
one of my questions was how to create incentives for, for industry to actually invest more, take it more seriously, if you like. Thomas, what do you think, to what extent, uh, because your focus is quite much on the downstream user yes. uh, communication, to what extent downstream users can also create demand for the upstream to actually provide good quality, reliable, fit-for-purpose data? I'm quite convinced that downstream users can create demand for high-quality data. However, the prerequisite uh, in that sense is then that we provide for a system which is able to transfer the adequate data in uh, a short time scale to the adequate place. Which means uh, when you consider some SME which is uh, flooded with a tsunami of exposure scenarios uh, creating piles of paper on the desks, this will simply not work. They are not able to deal with that. So what we need is a tailored communication, uh, focusing on the needs of the um, recipients. And uh, for that purpose, uh, we have uh, initiated uh, many years ago an initiative to uh, arrange for quality guaranteed standard phrases in safety data sheets. Uh, and today this is called UFRAC, European Standard Phrases Catalog, and we are dealing with the core part of the safety data sheet, and gratefully CIFIC is providing the exposure scenario part. And from the beginning onwards, we have uh, been moving close together in order to keep the systems compatible. We have standard phrases in the core part for today about 30 uh, languages, uh, which are available, and uh, these phrases must be clear in their structure, in what they are saying, and this must be of the same quality in each language, since you have to deliver the safety data sheets to the recipient in his country language, and we even have Mandarin and Russian and, and, and Arab uh, and so on. And uh, the quality is a very important point and we have a working group who is uh, dealing always with update of regulation and uh, comparable things in order to, to keep the phrases a jour. And um, moreover, we need for these uh, phrases uh, uh, the respective metadata behind and they are also uh, coordinated with a CEFIC approach and uh, one more thing which we are now addressing is, apart from the content of the safety data sheet, the way how it is transferred to the downstream, the supply chain. And uh, our ideal world would be uh, to have it in an electronic structured way, via an XML format, by the way. And there are two activities on CIFIC sites, it's ESCOM XML working on that, and our site it's SDSCOM XML. And uh, both activities are uh, aiming at establishing a electronically guided transfer of uh, the respective information downstream the supply chain, which would be much uh, faster than before. If you have a new classification in the system coming from the uh, chemicals provider, if you have a new H phrase in the system, it can quickly go down the supply chain and arrive at the worker's place. From now on, you have to wear gloves or uh, protection glasses or any other personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. And so the value of the data we gain now uh, can be measured in different currencies. One currency is on the administrative level or the monitoring on, of regulation, but the other is the concrete world mm -hmm. in terms of safeguarding uh, the um, environment, providing for healthy working places and providing for healthy consumer products. And there we can get much more progress if we establish yeah. such a system and therefore we need the support of the authorities such as ECHA. Mm. Then we can make the utmost of use uh, uh, from the value of these data and moreover we can increase, I'm sure, the perception, the acceptance at the um, level of all 
who are integrated in the system, uh, the end user will go back to uh, his provider and ask, uh, is this really a, a right phrase? Is your um, um, uh, value evaluation of the substance the right one? If there are doubts, you can play it uh, the, the direction back and clarify it. And so a, co a cooperation will be established. And, and this is, I think, the, the most important incentive I can imagine to make the system uh, better work. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, for ECA, this has been an area of, of interest and concern from the early years of, of REITs, and we've been together with industry trying to facilitate the downstream con communication through the so-called CSA pro program, the Chemical Safety Assessment Program, through the ENES network and all of that. Uh, I think it's a bit of a multi dimensional situation. On one hand, we have uh, proactive and forerunner companies. At the same time, there is still a big cluster of companies who uh, are perhaps not even compliant in terms of having the uh, exposure scenarios available. Mm -hmm. So in, in this setting of very many types of companies, very quite challenging technical ways of communication and even perhaps issues of awareness raising, uh, Erin, what you would see as, as a major uh, steps to improve the situation? Well, it's, it's of course, an, it's a difficult question and it's a difficult situation. Otherwise, we should have been solving it already a long time. If you look at uh, the CSR, ES, Chemical Safety Report Exposure Scenario Roadmap, which is about communication in two directions, down the chain and up the chain, in order to have a correct match on the information, on the uses, the ways it is used, and hence the necessary, the, the res the necessary uh, risk management measures that have to be communicated, that's clearly a challenge. And I think that the CSR ES roadmap has been creating a lot of the solutions that we need. The challenge nowadays is how to promote and sell these tools in order that they are known by a broader public, that they are used by all layers in the supply chain. And there, I think, if Thomas is referring to safety data sheets and looking for support to ECHA, my first remark should be, I should look in first instance, I'm clearly not excluding ECHA to, to be of help in that, but I think it's much more between industry, industry associations in close collaboration with authorities, knowing also that we have this uh, reach and force report uh, that will come up beginning of this year where the enforcement activity last year has been focusing on safety data sheets and exposure scenarios. That's where I think that we can come to a joint activity in order to improve starting from the data quality in the dossier, going to what is picked up in the chemical safety report, which is resulting in an exposure scenario, but also which is the base information for the safety data sheet, and that will be the structure in which we have to be creative to facilitate and to diminish the workload by trying to automize this as much as possible and to link it as much as possible to the available IT systems that we have to ultimately come to an electronic way of communicating, um, which is not the same as not respecting the obligation of sending the mandatory updates to the different companies. Uh, but it will be indeed receiving a document which is allowing an easy electronic extraction to do the next step of the process. And that's, I think, the way that we have to go in order to improve this fundamentally. Metzella, do you see a role for member states uh, here, either through help desk or awareness raising yeah, I guidance and or through enforcement? I think on awareness raising in, in particular, that was something I was going to come in on. I can only echo um, what Erwin has said and supports a lot of the points that he made. And we certainly, one key focus for us from an enforcement point of view is safety data sheets, always has been, and the quality is, is, is rather mixed. We also come across the issue, of course, that 
we inspect formulators, for example, they are not the people responsible for, for you know, doing the safety data sheet of the substances that come in, so you're trying to chase back up supply chains. Certainly, um, data quality in the registration dossiers in the first place. I always believe that poor data quality in the registration dossier leads to poor data quality in our supply chains, and, and that's, that's a given. Certainly, awareness raising um, can play a role, I think, particularly among downstream users and maybe smaller companies, that they have the right to receive this information and they have the right to ask it. And that's something that we raise that awareness of amongst companies that, that we inspect. Mm. And enforcement. I think all of this, yep. at the end of the day, comes down mm. to enforcement. Mm. And we certainly um, enforce the requirement for safety data sheets and the update. We get many questions to our help desk on safety data sheets. Our number one question area is obviously registration, closely followed by safety data sheets and the preparation of them and the updating and who's responsible. It's a key work area for us as authorities and we would certainly see us having a role in it and working with um, industry associations on it. Okay. Yeah. This also then perhaps nicely links us uh, to the uh, third uh, theme that we are going to discuss very briefly before letting you to uh, present your questions, and, and that is more into the future. And Crystal, you already mentioned in previously the sort of ambition of also uh, enabling use of, of REACH data for serving other policy areas or other pieces of legislation, which is also related to the downstream user communication, because of course the same information should be then serving occupational safety and health or environmental legislation or even uh, waste management. Uh, so. Perhaps where do you see the, the biggest opportunities and perhaps the biggest bottlenecks in, in expanding the use of REACH data to serve a wider audience and a wider set of uh, legislations? Thomas. One bottleneck is the way a uh, large part of industry are dealing today with uh, safety data sheets. Uh, they get uh, PDF files, they get paper uh, safety data sheets. In many companies there are people sitting at their desk typing in in the system uh, what they get per paper uh, from other parts of the world and uh, to be honest I think that it's, it's not uh, the way we should work today. And also speed is, a, is an aspect, not only efficiency, uh, as just mentioned, but also speed. If I have important safety aspects which came up quite new, they should be rapidly go through the system to the working place in order to guarantee for the protection which is uh, uh, to be established just now. So going digital. But typing in and uh, then printing out mm -hmm putting in an envelope, going to the uh, mailbox and uh, gluing a, 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 a postal mark uh, yep. on it. Yep. Uh, this is not hmm. the way we should hmm. work today. If you take it a bit broader perspective now, because we have only a couple of minutes left, uh, we've been now experiencing 10 and a bit more years of REACH implementation. Where do you see that we are in 10 years from now? What is your dream? What is the area where you would like to really go to the next level, where you really would like to expand the, the opportunities and, and, and to take full benefit of the opportunities that are ahead of us? So that could be also your kind of a closing statements, perhaps starting Can with I? you, Constanza. Uh, so uh, two things. One, I would like to see uh, something like uh, a feedback uh, from workers uh, and to have something in place uh, uh, something similar to pharmacovigilance uh, as a pharmaceutical industry, so a sort of collection of epidemiological data to understand whether uh, what we have done for REACH was uh, really uh, useful and it was uh, um, really uh, reached the goal of protect uh, workers, consumers and the environment. And uh, another, uh, another dream is to, to see toxicology embedded in chemical industry so uh, there is a project uh, like uh, green toxicology, so that uh, um, toxicology is part of the R&D department of any chemical companies, not only uh, the largest one. And uh, for example, there is the opportunity to test on a screening on uh, in vitro system at the very beginning of the development of a new chemicals to understand whether it is safe or not uh, and to understand whether it's worth uh, 
uh, going on with the uh, research uh, and develop a new application for that chemicals. Thank you. Lena? You took me, at least, as a <laughs> surprise by asking such a, such a I mean, long-reaching uh, question. But really, we have indeed, like Crystal Point, it's now soon the world's biggest data set on chemicals. We have concerns on its quality, accuracy, reliability, but still it is the biggest. And really, in 10 years, I really hope that we have made this leap in the improving its content and quality and that we have really also find the means to tr be more transparent towards the citizens, towards the, the third parties, academia, etc., how to use that data, also indeed for the other purposes, other legislation, and even, of course, the worldwide use of this data is, a, is I think, a dream that uh, a civil servant mm. is, <laughs> is allowed to have. And really important for me would be that ECA, member states and the commission, this group of authorities, where necessary, in collaboration with industry and other stakeholders, is really would work as a, as a seamless machine. So not always looking at what is to whom to, to act on, but really yeah. looking at the system effectiveness and efficiency. That would be my dream. Okay. Uh, Thomas, I bypassed you, but I'm not sure if you wanted to add something to your digital uh, I could communication add one <laughs> aspect that uh, step by step we might overcome the uh, hazard-based approaches, the pure hazard-based approaches, which are only focusing on the substance. We will never have a world without a hazard, but we should come more and more to a risk-based uh, consideration, which is including the conditions of exposure, and so uh, in order to establish a, a reliable system with adequate protection measures so that we can safely handle also dangerous substances which are dangerous only when uh, they uh, are not uh, in a batch process mm -hmm. or so. And, and uh, this would be my preference for, for the future, that we uh, talk more and more in terms of risk and bearable risk and uh, uh, less on simple hazard. Good, thank you. Marcella, then? Yes, I think I'll put on my enforcement <laughs> hat in answering this question because I think a lot of the points that I was going to make have been covered by, by Lena. I suppose from an enforcement point of view, in, in 10 years' time or even before that, I'd really like to see us tackle the REACH OSH interface mm. and have REACH inspections um, very much integrated into the routine chemicals inspections that are, that are done in workplaces. These companies that we inspect from a REACH point of view have many duties under many pieces of chemical legislation and a lot of the work that they would do, for example, under the Chemicals Agents Directive would help with their REACH work and vice versa. So I think it really, I really would like to see us tackling that and both from an enforcement authority point of view and from an industry point of view to not see REACH as this big extra thing that we need to do to one side, but it really becomes routine and part of our, our daily lives. So really tackle that interface. That's mm -hmm. where I'd like to, to see us. I will try at home. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, mm -hmm. Erwin then? Uh, if before reflecting on what comes in 10 years, I should like to look a little bit back on the last 10 years where I think there is a tremendous evolution that has been taking place looking at REACH and ECHA. Um, I should say between to June 2007 and more or less the workshop in the Commission December 2012, uh, this was what I call unpolitely a kind of salami approach where you got different departments, one working on REACH, one on evaluation, one on authorization, and where, let's say, the collaboration and under common understanding of what was happening in another department was far from perfect. I think with the publication of the Substances of Very High Concern Roadmap, where you got for the first time, let's say, registration as an input to check whether you have the data that you need and whether there is a concern which is then leading to a decision-making process. That is what has been happening from 2012 to now. If I now look at what will come knowing that we will have this REACH review in March, that we will have the fitness check 
probably end of Q2 that we got a plastic strategy that has been published, that we got the publication of uh, this, the chemicals products waste uh, interactions, that there is discussions ongoing on the interaction between OSH and other legis and OSH and REACH. There I think that ultimately, within 10 years, I see REACH uh, as much more the central database where all information is coming into and where you make in the most appropriate you way of using this information in legislations that you can't fundamentally change in the sense that we know if authorities want to change something in worker protection legislation, we have to change the Lisbon Treaty. But it's very clear that there is an enormous room of improvement on the interactions between REACH and us. REACH and Water Framework Directive, REACH and Waste Framework Directive, REACH and uh, ROS and whatever. And that's where I think that we will make the major um, progress in view of the circular economy. And if we look at the circular economy, this means that we will have to explain much more an understanding on chemicals legislation to the other parts of the world, which is not saying that they should copy and paste, but that at least they have a full understanding on what is required to come uh, in a legally correct way on the European market. And if we get there within 10 years, then I think that we have been doing a nice project. Thank you. Finally, Crystal, please. Well, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, first I have many dreams, so I don't know by which ones to start with. Two, uh, Erwin has pretty much summarized one of them. But if I reflect even further than you, Erwin, I've been recruited in 2002 by Bjorn Hansen, who is now my new executive director. And uh, we spend a lot of uh, time and resources to, uh, to with REACH, and basically the goal was ready to be able to reply on uh, whether the substance have been, uh, uh, can be used safely and to reply to the consumers on that. And that's what I was saying earlier. We wish to have a reply and I hope that by in 10 years we will be able to reply, collect the information to say, yes, this substance has been used safely. We did it in uh, Europe and uh, indeed, as you say, it's an example for the other countries and we manage it all together. That would be my dream number one, I would Good. say. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I think we can invite uh, questions from the floor. And meanwhile, perhaps we can also present the uh, results of the poll on this slide of question on the screen. So don't be shy, come forward with your questions. Or comments, your dreams, your nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> At least one over there. <laughs> okay, please. Yeah. Um, coming back to Jeanette Paulus, uh, Charles River. Um, coming back to the presentation of uh, Christelle this morning, you mentioned uh, implementation of uh, a nano in the uh, annexes uh, to be implemented possibly in 2020. However, last year, New guidance came out on nanos, where quite some uh, statements are given on how to uh, adapt your uh, testing. So how to handle that in the meantime? Do you act according to the guidance, or do you wait until 2020 when the uh, annexes have been updated? Maybe I give it to you, uh, Yuka, <laughs> because you follow much more than me than yep. the nanos. Okay. So. Uh, indeed, these are two parallel things. One is that uh, it's been said already for 10 years that as such REACH applies for substances in whatever form, including the nanoforms, and thereby the, uh, the, uh, uh, the obligations to ensure the safety is there also for substances in nanoforms. And that has been the basis for ECA to issue the guidance and to give training and awareness raising to companies how to do that. Uh, the results have been not very encouraging and therefore we've been also for many, many years uh, pressing and, and, and expressing our urgent uh, wish to, to uh, revise the annexes as soon as possible to have full legal clarity. 
but essentially the, the annexes are to provide clarity on the existing obligations. So the, the obligation is there already to uh, ensure the safe use, and that would be our anticipation that industry is, is uh, taking that seriously. And then, in any case, when the annexes are there, then you wouldn't have an ex any excuse anymore to, to not follow the annexes. So uh, it's a bit um, not so clear answer, uh, but also we've been quite uh, open recently about that uh, actually we don't have very efficient tools in actually enforcing REITs for nanomaterials, especially after the two decisions in relation to evaluation cases uh, issued by our Board of Appeal, uh, which confirmed that actually we cannot request the nanospecific substance information data, and thereby it is quite challenging for us to verify what is the actual scope of the, of the registration, and thereby then design uh, testing requirements that are targeted and proportionate. But again, this doesn't eliminate the uh, basic responsibility of industry of, of uh, ensuring safe use. So it's actually the measurement of what uh, product stewardship really means for companies in absence of explicit legal requirements. Okay. Thank you. I, I have another question. But, uh, <laughs> Please go ahead, yeah. yes. Uh, something completely different, uh, coming back to the discussion on the animal testing. Uh, we are also only representative and we've been asked by the inspection in the Netherlands, via, and that was uh, in, well instructed, but the information was given, was given by ECHA, um, why we did some, uh, or why uh, higher tier data were um, uh, submitted before having been asked for it. Um, well, we could give a, a satisfiable answer on that, that it was uh, necessary for other authorities. But I've seen a report, some years ago already, that Barreto stated that also there are answers that, well, no good reasons for that. So is there any enforcement on that, I was wondering, because that's a way maybe to, to, um, yeah, indeed. to look at that. Lena, please. Yeah, I think you are referring... You are indeed referring to the testing uh, without the test, submitting, submitting a testing proposal to ECHA and then waiting for the, for the permission to test. Indeed, we have been observing in our database several of such new t studies being done that should have been, I mean, first um, gone through the, the sort of the authorization of the testing proposals uh, regime. And when, when it's not clear in the, in the do dossier already why this has happened, um, yes, ECA investigates to an extent it can, and then refers the case to the national enforcement uh, to look deeper. Is there really, I mean, convincing uh, arguments why this study now suddenly exists? Sometimes it is really simple that the, actually the study date is wrongly expressed. So they had commissioned the study already well before, before the, the REACH um, provisions on testing proposals came into force. Sometimes it is more on the borderline indeed, what is actually the third country requirement for which the study is claimed to be done. And that is a, that is a bit of, a, I think, a issue that still requires some discussion between the REACH enforcers and also the Laboratory Animal Directive enforcers, especially if the study has been done in the EU for the claimed third country purpose. It has to be proven that it has really been necessary for, for that third country legislation purposes. So, so we have quite many cases, I'm, I'm afraid, that we need to follow up together with the enforcement authorities to clarify whether there have been some breach in, the, in this obligation. And then it's up to the national enforcement, of course, to see whether there should be penalties or, or other consequences. Okay, I'm continuing from here to these global um, regulations and their challenges. Do you see them as a kind of opportunities or as a kind of treats? Just referring to the previous question, actually. Who starts? Erwin? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, they are reality. They are there. The only thing you can see is we have indeed, or we got, 20 years ago, it was quite simple. You got three regulatory systems. You got the EU, you got US, you got Japan. Well, I should say four because Canada was there as well. What you see is since then there is quite some evolution which has been driven by a lot of activities and what you see is a plethora of reach legislations in the world which has 
probably less in common with REACH than what the name of the legislation is in many cases saying. I think except Korea REACH, which is very close for not saying rather good matching and trying to go further, and Korea REACH, which has been translating literally the EU REACH except the chapter on the agency and the member state competent authorities uh, activities into that because there's only one country. All the rest is um, a kind of referring to REACH without really going uh, or copying it which will at a certain moment in time result in a variety of legal systems in place and where we see for instance that China is for its ecotoxical ecotoxicological testing is only accepting tests on Chinese earthworms, which are quite different from the rest of the world earthworms, but more important, you can only do it in one of the nine accredited Chinese laboratoria. So there is indeed this kind of threat that you will have a multitude of chemicals legislation in the world and if this is going too far then I think that within industry there will pop up some demands uh, on can we try to harmonize this as much as possible. It's clear that my companies are not willing to stand up and say we want to have reach worldwide but some of the principles that we have in REACH and in US legislation are general principles. And I think what we have to go for is we have to put Euclid as IT tool central for chemicals legislation. We need to put OECD central, central in the decision making on the test methods that can be used to do the testing, because then we can link it to the mutual acceptance, which is another important OECD pillar that we have to maintain. And that there are then a kind of local varieties that is not the biggest problem, as long as there is no fundamental aberration between the concepts of what is asked in different places of the world. And on a much longer term, then we're going to see to what extent that some of these things will ultimately come together. I think from ECA's side we can only but agree with that statement. We call it often technical convergence, so whatever your regulatory setting is, you have to make sure that the data that is generated is applicable in different uh, jurisdictions and is also exchangeable and reusable and therefore indeed uh, IT tools and common formats are very important even though they may sound quite sort of a pragmatic uh, small things. Chris, uh, very briefly on this. Very and then briefly before. on that, indeed, uh, on the concept of robust study summary. I mean, the fact that we are insisting also to have good dossier, it's at the advantage also of the companies. Never a uh, Euclid dossier will be accepted by US EPA if the robust study summary is not of quality. You know that the US, for the time being, are asking the full study report. We always try to discuss with them to understand what is the good robust study summary, but so long it will be uh, not of sufficiently quality and uh, robust, never you will be able to submit the uh, Euclid data to the US. And that's something that should be put on the table to see how we improve that. Okay, thank you. And sir, you have the last question. Okay, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not certain whether it's a dream or a nightmare. So, Jouni Honkovar, Rietzlo, I would have a very simple question on the, on the deadline on 120 days. So, in, in the morning we discussed uh, uh, what to do with the testing capacity and there were some recommendations related to director's group. And it seems that many of the companies, the, the problem is making business decisions whether to register or not, and that is still ongoing. And the fundamental problem which has two sides is the letter of access cost. So my question is that in my understanding there was a proposal on the director's group on some kind of lenience on the letter of access cost based on, 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 on something. 
And I would like to know what was the proposal, what was the origin of the proposal, and the outcome of the pro uh, proposal, and also what is the mandate of director's group in this regard? Okay, thank you. I can Crystal? start, maybe Owen can continue. <clears throat> so, the original of the proposal comes from ECA, uh, further to a study that we've done on SME, uh, let's say, a market segmentation of SMEs to do the promotion of the cloud services, where we collected a lot of uh, worries from SMEs that they would not register because of the cost of uh, the letter of access. Therefore, ECA did uh, quite a drastic uh, proposal or pragma what we call a pragmatic approach, saying probably for the one to 10 ton, considering the data package, which is relatively low, maybe a consortia or lead registrant could consider a very low price for this uh, letter of access. That would, that would be their benefit. They would avoid to discuss uh, endless uh, the cost of this data, plus it would avoid data sharing dispute. So maybe a pragmatic approach could be uh, envisaged, and that was was proposed to the director contact group. The director contact group had no legal mandate. I mean, it's voluntary anyway. And it's a good uh, collective effort to try to find pragmatic solution to help the companies to register. There have been a lot of discussion with within this group, and at the end, a zero cost, as was maybe proposed by ECA as an extreme solution, but quite uh, pragmatic, I must say, uh, was not, uh, we didn't find consensus on that, and it has been agreed in December that it would be a low cost, affordable, and reasonable, or whatever, I don't remember the term exactly, uh, lump sum. And, and again, a lump sum would avoid entering in endless discussion about how much a study cost, and, uh, and uh, that's what uh, Laura was explaining this morning. That's, uh, of course, for substance which have already been registered, for which it's possible to, to do that. And maybe, Owen, you want to complement. Yeah. Maybe to, to, to add also on the origin of uh, the director's contact group that has been mentioned already uh, today, it's very clear that there is no legal mandate. It's consisting of people from the Commission, ECA, and in nine industry associations at this moment in time, and where the only tasks that we can take up are looking for pragmatic solutions for problems that we are confronted with, with registration registration and remaining within the legal text of the REACH legislation. So if you will read or if you have read the outcome, it may still remain rather vague, but I think, let's be very honest, this has been probably the most difficult point that we've ever been discussing in uh, the director's contact group and where I still feel proud that ultimately after some hours on a late Friday evening we came to let's say the most pragmatic possible solution to be of help in this kind of discussion. And while the DCC doesn't have a formal mandate and, and legal basis of course we are committed to then implement in our legal setting the, the solutions that we are part of in, in creating the DCT. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, then uh, one on the dream department. How do you sort of see the authorization SHVC process going on? And what are the sort of lessons learned so far? Who wants to, you want to take it? <laughs> That's, uh, we, we haven't been discussing the, the whole risk management very, very much here. I, I think it has a, had a very sort of a good start in terms of it, we've been making it, it working. It's been made working in a quite interactive fashion, so that we've been also investing quite a lot in explaining to industry what is the purpose, how is it working, both in the identification step and now lately also in the authorization application step. So I, I think it, it's working, but at the same time we learn and we very uh, openly listen to different concerns from different audiences, including, of course, not only industry, but also the stakeholders and also uh, the policy level, like the European Parliament has shown quite keen interest on, on the workability or the, the, the impact of the authorization and the, and the working of the authorization system. Um, so it, it's working in practice, but we are still improving and, and trying to, to keep it workable at the same time, trying to uh, make sure that it, it's achieving its objectives, which is a fine balance to, to find. Then finally, perhaps, Sylvie. Okay. Yeah. 
Hello, Steve Willemann from, uh, from Dow. Also looking ahead, uh, I had a question, well, several questions in uh, relation to the role of science in decision making, and in particular in the areas where science is evolving very quickly. Um, we talked about uh, evolving test methods, for example, but I actually have in mind more the emerging issues or concepts. You know, we all, all know endocrine disruptors are, are coming, there's guidance on long range transport being developed. We're talking of new concepts like uh, persistent mobile, toxic, equivalent level of concern, and so on. Uh, this will likely further develop. And I was wondering if uh, ECA had any plans to uh, involve more academics. I mean, they are top scientists in the world, in universities, working in these fields. I know there are expert groups working, you know, these, at least ECA PBT expert group or ED expert groups. We believe that more could be done to really integrate the, um, the, the best, the top class scientists in the world into developing guidance, but also into helping decision making. So I'm wondering if, if ECA has uh, something in mind besides ad hoc workshop, something really more sustained. Now, in relation to that, as science evolves, test data evolve, and I could, I could imagine that classification and labeling based on new data could be different tomorrow on certain substances. Maybe even an SVHC status could be one thing today, different tomorrow. Do you see any reversibility uh, or updates in, in this kind of uh, status, classification labeling or, or SVHC? And finally, uh, what is ECA doing on international cooperation? I mean, we talked about OECD and so on, but what are, what are exactly your, uh, your plans for the future, maybe to enhance that? Thank you. Okay, that was three questions, actually. Um, to, to, keep, to keep it short, uh, on the international, actually, with, uh, with Björn entering ECA and with his international background, it's a good time for us, and also as we are actually just uh, finalizing our new strategy for the years to come, international is one dimension of that. It is a strong and very much an integrated dimension of what we will be doing, but I'm not going, giving you the concrete answer what exactly are we going to do. That we can tell you, I think, in, in half year's time, but it will continue to be an, an important uh, dimension of our work, as also the science will continue, uh, I think, it hasn't, I, I would disagree a bit slightly with you that it hasn't been sort of ad hoc issues only events here and there. It's been a strategic consideration. Perhaps we could have invested in more, but of course our priority was to make the system work. And um, I think that's also part of our new strategy that we will rethink what is the best way of, to integrate with the science and to continue a two-way dialogue, which is also, it's, it's a quite severe investment if you do it seriously. It, it doesn't just help that you go into a conference or workshop. Actually, it needs continuous uh, dialogue and it needs investment. And that's why also we have to think it seriously. It is also very important for what uh, Costanza were referring previously, the further uh, promotion of the alternatives, but all, all in, in all areas. And I, I think it's also very important now when the, uh, the evidence-based decision-making is more and more questioned in, in the most modern society. So it is a very serious strategic thinking that we have to do. And finally, in principle, all the decisions on classification, labeling, SVHC identification are in principle reversible if there is evidence and if there is uh, then a initiative either from the Commission or Member State to change the existing uh, uh, decision. With that, uh, I would like to close this panel. We see the results of the um, uh, question there. So uh, the majority would like to uh, see the improved communication on safe use as the highest priority for the years to come, uh, with a more or less uh, equal amount of votes for the more harmonized classifications. So these are the priorities from your side. And I would like to thank all the panelists and also thank you for your attention and contributions. And finally, invite Björn to give us the closing words. Björn, please. Stay here.
Yes, thank you very much for a very exciting panel and look forward uh, and for many questions provoking many thoughts on where that forward going is going to take us. Um, I have the absolute pleasure to give some closing remarks before you get to run out and, um, and uh, take advantage of all the experts sitting around who can answer further questions. Here are some numbers of today's event, uh, presented in a little bit uh, less flashy form as I did uh, in the opening, but quite impressive all the same. I couldn't help but have one reflection that I'll just share with you. Had we organized this event 20 years ago on the implementation of the previous le legislation before REACH, I think you could apply an assessment factor of anything between 10 and infinity to these numbers. Um, 25 to 50 people would be here. There would not be anything online. It didn't exist, so hence no online questions. We could have gotten maybe 20 to 30 people on Euclid, but that was only because 20 years ago we moved from the DOS version to the window version, and people didn't know how to click around in Windows. And then finally, one-on-one -on -one session, I think we would have managed 14 because there would only be one person from our side that you could talk to, and just about 14 uh, discussions is what you could do in one day. Um, I'll sum up a few words, but I think I'll just show you this slide to start out with because a lot of what I'm going to say is answering the second question. First of all, please come with your feedback, and the feedback that we're looking for is what you thought of this event and clearly what you would like to see on future events. But the last session here already gave a list that's going to fill the agenda for the next 10 years, and I'll come with a few of them. But before that, I'll sum up a little bit what we've been talking about today. And I think I'll start with the concerns coming from uh, registrants, coming from you um, participating here. And I, I, I unjustly will summarize it in four points, that there are issues on data sharing, on cost sharing, on role of the lead registrant, and on the issue of getting the test data done. Those were the most, most frequently heard issues. And I think the reply that I'll come with from ICA, but also uh, from, the, from the National Help Desk, is to say, don't panic. We're not panicking. <laughs> um, I think one indication was what Crystal said, uh, we fully understand how much work you have in front of us. And I think the fact that she mentioned that we've, we've hired for a very short term, so it's unlucky or un, unfortunate for them, but we've, ha we've hired for a rather short term over 100 extra people for, and trained them and got them ready to, to help us out over the next six months in terms of registration. Um, so we understand that you have an additional workload. Uh, and we've been training over 100 people uh, to be able to manage this, this registration deadline and your work. So we fully understand you. And our panic is controlled. Um, so don't panic. Come to us. We do have exceptional... Come to us, and here I'm including the national help desks. We have the, the exceptional um, uh, cases, uh, possibilities. We have the, the director's contact group solutions, as we call them. Check them out and inform us in ECA if you need to use any of them. So um, I think that's the main, main message is there is a lot of issues on the table, but we actually have solutions, and we, together with the National Help Desks, will work it out with you to make sure you can meet the deadline, and we can get into the final phase of REACH, where things will really start happening compared to how it was before, and that was what the panel, I think, was telling us here, that a lot of things are on the agenda uh, for the future, and I think if we just start with the dossiers themselves, we have the issue of compliance of registration dossiers to the information requirements and how to meet those or how to react to it in terms of grouping, alternative methods, collaborations, cooperations, and international dimension of bringing in expertise through our existing networks and, and working relationships, for example, at the OECD. Um, we have the issue of um, 
updates, which was mentioned several times, that please remember that your registration dossier is actually the beginning of your REACH life. It's not the end. And what this means is that the better the registration is up front, the less ICA and ultimately the commission, if necessary, will bother you. The same goes for member state competent authorities and the same message goes for your updating. If you update, the less properly and in, in accordance with what you're, how you're actually using the substance will be bothering you a lot less and you can come to the next event with a big smile on your face rather than right now in, in this hectic uh, period. We also heard here on the panel a lot of other additional issues uh, raised about the future and I'll just pick up two of them um, to reflect on when you answer the question here on what you would like to see here and, and that's the enforcement, enforcement, enforcement all the great benefits that I mentioned were planned and are being seen in REACH implementation, of course, will, will, gets diluted if we do not have enforcement and we do not have enforcement uh, harmonized or at least similarly enforced over Europe. And I think that message came, came through very much. And the final thing is the OECD work in which we as ICA, but also our friends in DG Environment and DG Grow and DG Sante in Brussels have the agenda that everything that is used and adopted in OECD we use and adopt in REACH and therefore we are fully internationalized with the tools that are used in REACH and CLP and biocides and the issue is therefore to promote that use internationally um, and I think that that's also the message uh, that we got here. So enforcement and there's an international dimension where I think now, with REACH, with everybody having done their registration and going into to weeping in, or sweeping in the, the advantages of REACH, we can go international. So with those words, I'd like to close this part of the conference or, or yeah, st st of this stakeholder workshop and say many, many thanks to you all. Thanks to the panel, thanks to the organizers, uh, thanks to all the, the dear colleagues here in ICA who, who made this event possible, that I could just come in here and stand and say a few words. Um, so thanks a bunch to everybody uh, for that, and let's give a big hand for, that, for them. <laughs> Whoops. I should have shown you the slide of the next events, but this is the one. Uh, that I really wish you lots of success uh, up until May. And remember, we're there to help. Thanks. <laughs>